Okay, hello everybody and welcome to a second in our Growing Food Poverty webinar series. Um, today we will be looking at collaborative research and community action. Um, and now collaborative research, it can bring a distinct advantage um, to any project. It has a lot of scope for things like exchanging of new ideas, learning new skills, access to funding, um, higher quality research results as well as a result of that. Um, we're really lucky today to have with us um, Maddie Power from the Department of Health Science in York University, who will be talking about a project that she um, is co-coordinating um, co with the York Food Justice Alliance and we have the co-chairs of the York Food Justice Alliance with us as well, Sydney Corley and Mary Passery who will be giving their perspective on that collaboration. Um, I've just got a few slides here to share with you to talk with you a little bit about Godan um, and what we are doing through our food poverty working group. Um, so for those of you that haven't yet come into contact with um, Godan. Now, Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition um, supports the proactive sharing of open data and knowledge to deal with the urgent challenges of ensuring world food security. So at the heart of Godan is a growing network of over 1,200 partners from governments, private and public sector organisations, and all of them have signed up to a joint statement of purpose, that of supporting the proactive sharing of open data. Um, we focus on building high level support among governments, policymakers, international organisations and the private sector. Um, and we focus on promoting collaboration to harness the growing volume of data generated by new technologies um, to solve long-standing nutrition and food security challenges. We also um, do a lot of advocating for smallholder farmers and minority groups within food supply chains. Um, so to achieve this, we encourage collaboration and cooperation between stakeholders within the sector. So hence our interest in, in this um, in this sector as well, because we're looking at how we can connect up um, universities and research institutes within the UK um, in order to see if we can look at best practices um, and look at lessons learned that can be applied elsewhere. There we go. I have a short video that the York Food Justice Alliance has prepared um, in order to show you a little bit about what we're doing. And we're thinking that we're going to start with that um, so that you can get a taste um, for what they're doing within the community. So if you bear with me one second, I will just share that with you. How many people out there will look at their fridge and think, I need to really go food shopping? Um, look, what do I do with that? In this last two weeks, one of the ladies that used to come into us regularly for food, advice on how to cook, we, um, she got very excited one day as we showed her how to use a hand blender and she learned how to make soup. She came in every day and got a new recipe, has died, waiting to have help with a pit form. There are so many people out there who are on the edges of disability, edges of poverty, and actually on the edges of society that nobody's looking at. Food is, should not be a political argument. I've just sat and spoken to a lady in tears who is a professional. She works in a school, she, um, is a single mum, she's really, really struggling, she's desperate to make ends meet, Universal Credit has stuffed her over, um, she's possibly going to lose a car, which means she can't get to work, and I just sit here and think, God, how? How is somebody who's a professional person in a school, which is the thing we should be revering most, our education system, we should be ploughing every penny we've got into it, sitting in front of me in tears, asking for fruit and veg, asking for bread, asking for basic, basic food. She doesn't want steak, she didn't want anything extravagant, she wasn't asking for a tin of caviar, 
She was asking for some carrots, some potatoes and some bread. It still took a long time for this money mm. to come in. Is even this when you'd applied for Universal Credit? When I applied, but yeah. yeah. Even though I, we're basically a straightforward process mm. of getting it all sorted, I quickly realised that I couldn't pay my rent. Mm. Cooker has broken. Yeah. It has before Christmas. I'm living off a hob, a small top oven, luckily, even that's dodgy. Yeah. Um, to make benefits slightly more flexible right. for people who need them, there should be a pocket of money aside that I, or these are towards a cooker so I can mm. cook a better food for my family. Mm. One of the most expensive things is meat, um, mm. which I don't actually eat, but I've found that corn is pretty similar in price. Yeah. Um, mm. And then I'd say after that, fresh fruit yeah um which obviously is one of the things i really want to get into me and my kids yeah. but we end up being able to i end up being able to buy enough for maybe three days mm. and then the rest of the week we end up eating rubbish i am really really struggling um i just can't seem to stop crying I just feel angry all the time. I'm just generally not very well. I'm already stressed to hell because I've got no money. I've got no way of earning any money at the moment above and beyond what we're already doing. Um, I'm doing a second job on top of the job I do already, helping people in poverty. My husband's working as many hours as can physically help at work. Um, my mum and dad are helping. I just, there is no more money. I can't. I don't get any benefits, I don't get any support. So what are the solutions? The politicians need to listen to us. Everyone deserves a living wage. These things, this sharing food, is just a stopgap. We need to go to the source and everyone deserves to live properly. Sorry about that, YouTube just skipped on. Um, so um, now sharing with us um, their experiences around collaborative research and action are Maddie Power. Now Maddie Power is a research fellow at the Department of Health Science of the University of York, who's done extensive research around food access inequality, lived experience of food poverty insecurity and emergency food systems. And we also have experts by experience and co-chairs of the York Food Justice Alliance, Sydney Corley and Mary Passeri. Um, the York Food Justice Alliance is a partnership of groups organizations, local media and individuals who are looking to tackle food poverty in York and in the surrounding area in the UK. Um, and we would really appreciate it if you have any questions. We'll be taking several breaks during the presentations. If you would please just put them in the chat um, and we'll get to them when we take um, breaks during those presentations. So Maddie, if you are ready, then I will pass over to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Right, I'm just gonna share my screen. Right. Fantastic. Well, many thanks for having us here today, Kate, and for showing that video. I should say that's a, a short video, the shortened version in some ways of a longer video that we made as part of um, work that we did in the Alliance. Um, it was York Community Reporters, so people who, including from Sydney and Mary, who are both here today, who then took on as, as chairs of the Alliance, made videos about their own experience of kind of food and poverty. Um, and we put it all together, um, and that's the shorter version. And if you want to see the longer version, it's about 50 minutes. That's also on our YouTube channel. I think it's also on our website. Um, so it hopefully just gives you a sense of kind of people's lived experiences and like life and work in the community of York. I'm going to speak um, a bit just about how we set up the Alliance and then a bit about the research findings. Um, and then I'll hand over to Sydney and Mary just to talk about what they're doing now and how they're taking it forward. Um, we'll have a few sections, as Kate said, for questions. So please do ask us any questions and we'll all answer them together. Um, in each section. So, so that was it's the York Community Reporters video. Um, so if you're interested, do check it out. So I just I want to start a bit before I kind of dive into what we did about the kind of value of doing participatory research anyway. Um, and actually, particularly on, on kind of 
topics like food poverty or poverty um, and community issues, actually often research is done in quite an aloof way and people are talked about rather than it being a conversation. So we are really keen to kind of move the conversation to make it an inclusive one. Um, and also to kind of recognize that actually to solve any issue, a particular issue at kind of a local level, we need to utilize a wide range of expertise, expertise that comes from um, practice, from lived experience, from books, from theory, and bring that all together. And also to actually recognize that research that's participatory can often be much more impactful because actually you can be kind of having impact and having action as part of the research that you're doing. And I think something that's hopefully Sydney American will agree with that I think has come out of the Alliance is that actually the impact was kind of came through the work that we did. It wasn't like a kind of research project and then there was impact. It was, it was the work together that I think kind of meant that we had impact and we were successful. So quickly, what did we do? So, and I, I can notice on the call early on that um, a man called Adrian Lovett is here, um, who is a, as an audience member, but he was a key person in this alliance. So he definitely deserves a lot of credit here. So in about 2018, I think it was now, um, Adrian actually initially applied for a really small, or it was a small pot of money from an organization called Food Power, who were uh, supporting the development of lots of local alliances um, throughout the country. And I collaborated, collaborated with Adrian. Um, together we developed this alliance because there's a kind of recognition in York that there was lots of organisations working on food poverty and concerned about it as an issue, but there wasn't really that much collaboration between the organisations. And so in terms of the impact they could have as a whole, it was potentially a little bit limited. Um, so we gained some match funding from the local authority, from local government, and then we had this small pot of money um, and we use this to kind of for the initial setup of the alliance. So we initially kind of had a few organisations who we knew were keen to take part, but then we spent a lot of time reaching out to organisations. So it was a mixture of organisations um, kind of providing food aid, so organisations like food banks and community cafes and informal food banks. Um, the local authority was a key partner from the beginning and they gave us some funding. The two universities we had, so we had University of York, which, which I work at, and then the University of York St. John, which is another university in York for collaborators. But then we did things like reaching out to the local football club who had a charitable arm. Um, and, and so I tried to have a kind of diverse alliance. And a lot of it was legwork. A lot of it was about, I kind of cycled over to an organisation and said, we're doing this. Are you interested in being involved? This is what's going on. And through that kind of like word of mouth and kind of cycling all over the city, we set up this alliance that was a kind of diverse group with some organisations that were really local, just small scale community cafes, and then some organisations that were actually national, but they happen to be based in York. So the um, Joseph Rowtree Foundation was uh, also a member of the Alliance. We wanted from the start to kind of have a sense of kind of common ground. So we co-developed some principles and aims, and I'll show you them in a sec, that we would kind of be formed around. And so we had three key principles that underpinned our work. But then we had kind of seven or so aims that were kind of specific things that we wanted to achieve as an alliance. And those were kind of developed together as a, as a community so that we were all on board. We co-identified points of concern around food insecurity in York. So we got together and we kind of said, well, what's, what's the problem? And actually from our perspective, the problem is this particular kind of betrayal of food poverty. And I'll come onto that in a minute. Um, and that's what we want to identify. So we really kind of co-identified that point of concern. A key kind of activity, a key kind of role of the Alliance really was about coordinating existing provision and developing new provision. So I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail before I go on. But actually when we set up, there was a kind of sense that there's lots of people doing work in York, but there isn't much coordination. And so if someone needs to find a food bank or needs to find something on Tuesday, how do they know, where do they go? So we kind of took various kind of different approaches to this. So we mapped, all existing provision that was going on in York and we produced these little maps that you can see on this picture here, community food map, that we distributed all over the city. Um, that might be in libraries, they might be in the local authority, they might be in community cafes, so that people have this like quite nice map that wasn't in any way stigmatising, included lots of different types of um, food aid provision and people could just have a look and see where something was and when it was open. Um, in doing that we then kind of identified places there were gaps, so gaps in terms of geography, like this particular area of the city didn't have any provision, but also maybe gaps in terms of demography, like 
is there actually not enough provision for parents, for instance, or, or not enough provision for maybe kind of men who are homeless on the street? So thinking about different demography. And we kind of particularly, there was a particular area where there was a kind of lack of provision. So we came together, people who were working in that area and set up this new community cafe, which is called the Red Tower Cafe, which proved to be immensely successful. And then kind of is now really expanded and is doing, doing really well and is, is open access. So one thing that we kind of were really, really kind of conscious about when we were setting up new provision was to make it as as kind of least stigmatizing as possible so all the provision was just open access anybody could anyone could come there was no means test there was no referral system um, and we tried to have it as open as much as we could so there's no sense of well actually if you're not available at 1 p.m on a monday you can't come so we tried to meet, have it as kind of universal a system and kind of open access and then we co-developed research and policy to kind of understand food poverty in York and really kind of tackle it. So these were our kind of three key principles that kind of under, underpinned the work of the Alliance. Um, essentially emphasizing the kind of the structural causes of food poverty, the fact that it's about income and insecure housing and insecure employment. The importance of food as a kind of something that's nice, it's nutritious, it's important to our health and well-being. Um, and then also actually the, the complexity of like why someone might go to a food bank. So the different needs that they might have and actually you need to kind of look at the whole person and think about how you can address all those different needs. One thing that we certainly did as part of a kind of key activity as part of our coordination and making sure that provision did exist for those who need it was a lot of work around um, holiday hunger. So um, children being able to access food in the school holidays, so out of term time when they would normally have free school meals. Um, so when we set up the Alliance, there was kind of, there were organisations who were providing food in the holidays, but there wasn't any, again, kind of really much coordination between those. So it was sometimes quite hard for parents particularly to know like where to go or when it was on, when this kind of activity or session was on. So it, we kind of put, it, put together a programme which we distributed really, really widely. Um, and then where there were gaps, we identified where the gaps were and if we could fill them in any way. So this is just a kind of a quick overview of, of the amounts of um, meals and food parcels that were provided between this particular period of summer 2018 and Easter 2019. So between these periods, this is kind of roughly about 4,000 meals are provided um, by these activity clubs to children and their parents. So they'd all be open access. So there'd be something on and, and generally be anyone could come. It doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich or whatever. And there'd probably be an activity along the side. So there might be some arts things or might be some sort of activity, some sort of sports based things. We work particularly with the football, the local football club who put on this kind of a kind of food bank in combination with um, the football kind of training they would be doing anyway. And we were really keen when we were doing this to get a sense of like why people are using the services and how they found those services. So we sought feedback um, and we always tried to see feedback as we went along. Uh, we did a kind of small survey of the people who were um, using these what we call holiday hunger clubs um, and just to kind of get a sense of people's the level of need like particularly kind of food and security need among among the population using those clubs and essentially our survey, our survey showed that people did need these these um, holiday hunger clubs and actually food insecurity was kind of so food poverty was much worse people struggled with food much more um, out of term time in the school holidays because they didn't have access to free school meals. So that was kind of, I suppose, the kind of main activity, but we can talk about that in much more detail because it's a, it's a kind of quick overview of what we did. The main kind of other tranche was, was co-developing research because when we initially kind of got together back in 2018, there was a strong sense actually that people knew food poverty was a concern in the city and could see rises in people using food banks but people didn't really know what was going on and so as an alliance we kind of thought we need to know what's going on before we can really tackle it so we kind of came together over multiple meetings we probably meet about every month to discuss what the problem was and what we could do and how we could research it and we decided together that actually a priority of the alliance was households with young children that that was seen as a kind of a priority concern um, and our approach then was to have various kind of channels of research. So we co-developed and co-administered a survey of families with young children, which explored um, food insecurity and food poverty, food bank use, and then kind of the demography of their household and their diet. 
um, and we administered this through local primary schools. So we really used the network of the Alliance and all, all the different links that each member of the Alliance had with local primary schools to, to send the survey, to administer it through local primary schools. Um, and actually we got a good response rate because we use those community networks and because someone contacted the primary school and there's already a, a relationship of trust there, which is really important. I mean, the research was kind of feasible. And then we co-developed and co-conducted some focus groups. Um, so that was done with, particularly with our research assistant, who is Rosie Baker, who played a huge role in the Alliance throughout, um, with parents, with young children, to kind of get people together in a room and explore their thoughts and ideas and their lived experiences of food poverty. Um, and they were kind of quite informal and they were often just done within a kind of a community venue, like a community cafe, and people could turn up and just talk about their experiences. And then I suppose the second bit was that we did this community reporter project, which isn't on here, but you saw a kind of snippet of it earlier on. It was just a really small number of parents who used their smartphone to record their own experiences. And then we had lots of different kind of pieces of video which we brought together to make a, a longer film um, about their experiences. So kind of, there was like a visual aspect as well as the kind of the audio. And then, so the final kind of big asset was co-developing policy. Because once we'd done all this research, we were really keen that actually it fed through into something. So analysed um, the data and then we presented the findings to the group and we said kind of actually based upon these findings, what should be our policy recommendations? What should we recommend? So we had kind of about five policy workshops with the Alliance members where we used millions and billions it seemed of, of sticky notes and we put them everywhere and all over boards and had lots of different ideas of what we could do and people ranked their different kind of preferences in terms of the policy options they thought were the best options. We came up with a final list of um, policy recommendations which we kind of sent around the alliance and we asked everyone to sign off and be happy. We wanted everyone to be happy with these recommendations and then we put together a, a kind of a report which is called Seeking Justice which included all our research findings, how we developed the alliance, and then our policy recommendations. And there's a kind of a few just in the corner of the screen here um, that these were intended for local government. Um, and we launched this report at an event that was intended by local stakeholders and local politicians. Um, and our policy recommendations, I think, really did influence the council in terms of their strategy and their development, and it put food poverty on the agenda. Um, and they set up a food poverty scrutiny group in the aftermath to kind of look at food poverty in more detail um, and actually if you look at the work of the council now I think there's many things that we we're calling for that you can kind of attribute um, maybe to our work and, and see what's going on in terms of council policy now it does reflect some of the policy recommendations of the alliance. So what are our successes? Uh, to be honest I actually think we were fairly successful and I hope Cindy and Mary also agree that I think in a short space of time we did achieve quite a lot. We from, I suppose, there was already a huge amount going on in York in terms of work around poverty and, and food poverty. But we did manage to bring together actually what was quite a diverse group of stakeholders um, to tackle food insecurity. So people who hadn't worked together in the past and people actually who came from quite different places. And often there was some kind of local politics that you had to bridge and there was kind of the local council worked in very different ways than some community groups. And actually they didn't see eye to eye and it was a kind of task to bring those groups together to find common ground and to move forward as a collective. We did conduct in a fairly short space of time kind of robust research that, that was collectively conducted um, and, it's, and it came out of the concerns of the Alliance members. So it was very much driven from the grassroots. It was what the Alliance said should be researched is what we then researched. Um, we were successful in, certainly in setting up new and inclusive open access provision where it was needed and, and the kind of the Red Tower in York is a particularly excellent example of provision that was set up and flourished quickly and then had lots of additional services as part of its food service. We engaged a lot with the local authorities, they were part of the alliance itself, they came to meetings, um, but also in terms of how we followed up our recommendations that, that that seemed to feed through into council strategy and work going forwards. And we also had kind of essentially political influence by the fact that two members of the alliance um, were elected as local councillors, as members of local government, kind of towards the latter stage of the alliance. So that was a direct channel of political influence. We had really extensive local media coverage, um, um, and Sydney and Mary have both been on um, BBC Radio York many, many times, which I think was really helpful in just raising awareness about food poverty in York, because York often has a, an image, a stereotype as being quite a wealthy city. 
um, when it's really not, it's a highly unequal city. And so actually having that media coverage was really important in just raising awareness and putting food poverty on the agenda in York. And also one of my, I think one of the greatest successes is that, so I, I, I initially chaired the Alliance, but then I handed over to Sydney and Mary who knew the topic so much better than me from kind of lived experience and direct experience. Um, now they're taking it forward and it's going brilliantly. So for me, that's a great success. Um, but inevitably, there are also some challenges um, that there are with any participatory work and any kind of community work, I think. So when I kind of mentioned that when we started, like between these kind of various organisations who'd worked in York for decades and between the local council, which was um, kind of or quite bureaucratic and often quite kind of authoritarian, there was lots of local politics. And so bringing people together and finding common ground took kind of care and negotiation and listening to different people's perspectives and finding where where there was where we could come together um, took time and took care. Um, I think also kind of I came in, I've not always lived in York and I come from a university that's sort of situated in a city but it's often quite aloof so there was a, a challenge certainly for me of kind of gaining trust of why I should be kind of leading this at least initially. Um, I think ensuring kind of all member voices were heard equally is another challenge that inevitably with kind of work like this you might have some voices who are louder than others so making sure that each opinion is heard equally and taken on board will always take time and care. Embedding real and lasting policy impact I mean I think we did have some impact but whether that will go forward and certainly at time of COVID where actually there's kind of fast paced change around food poverty and food aid and at the local level. I think there's always some dangers that things that we were saying actually then just get ignored in the moment. Um, things about structural changes or things about kind of not just going down a food bank route and thinking more holistically about people's needs. And then funding and time constraints. So we did have some money, a small pot of money um, for the project, um, but we could probably always have done with more to enable us to do more. And the time in which we did the research was, was relatively short, um, which limited the kind of the extent to which the kind of analysis could be participatory. Um, the kind of co-development the policy was, but the analysis itself of the findings wasn't particularly participatory. Grand, well, we could stop now for questions and then I'll, before we talk about the research findings themselves. Sorry, thank you, Matty. That was a fantastic presentation um, with loads of brilliant, you know, insights and information that I'm sure a lot of us can use and learn from. Um, we have a question here from Hilary Hamer, um, who is asking about the contents of the food parcels, whether they differed throughout the year, and if so, how? So the ones at the Holiday Hunger Club, those particularly in that graph, they'll probably be quite different according to the organisation. So in food, in like formal trust adjust food banks, the parcels are very standardised, but in other organisations that are just community-based organisations and don't have that kind of standardisation, they're often much more generous and different. Sydney and Mary, would you have anything to say on that? Yeah, we ran a holiday hunger, play, stay and play scheme. And... Um, we introduced children actually to lots of vegetables that maybe they'd not seen before. So that was a lot of fun, getting the fresh vegetables in there as well as things that they sort of recognise like a good old ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. So that, that was fun. But the food parcels that we gave as we were then chilling the community were um, heavily dependent on donations. We worked with the local allotment society, which was brilliant because they gave us lots of fresh food and that was seasonal stuff which was a surprise to a lot of people they didn't yeah. they didn't understand food was seasonal did they a lot of the time no there's a lot around the corner either <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that was quite interesting but um as Maddie rightly said, it varies so much from different groups because you could only give out what you got. I mean, we, we were getting things that you didn't want to give to people really, like Cocoa Pops, but you had to give what you had. And it was as simple as that, really, which is in itself, as Maddie sort of pointed out, a, a social injustice in and with itself. Mm, it's amazing to see the change from back then until now. Um, the change has been incredible on what we can offer people. Mm. Um, not just through us, but other groups in York is astonishing. It is is the change been amazing for everybody? So yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. 
and Hilary saying thank you for the answers. <laughs> um, so I've got a um, question from Lopa Mandra from Coventry University. Um, a couple of questions, mainly for Maddie here. Um, so how was the research initially funded and how was it sustained? So it was initially funded. So what, what was a bonus that I was working at the time on another project called I Know Food that essentially was just quite flexible in how I use my time. So I was funded by that project. And then the money that we had, so we had 10,000 pounds from Food Power and we had match funding from the local authority. And that money was used to partly pay for a research assistant who was Rosie Baker, um, which tied us over. So essentially it was done on a bit of a shoestring, um, but we had enough money to tie us over, but it was, a lot of it was because I was already, my role was already funded. Um, Fantastic, thank you. And Lupa's asking as well um, that the Alliance includes 15 members. Um, so who does it include? Is there any um, overriding pattern really as to who's included in that? It's changed dramatically, hasn't it? It has, yeah. COVID um, over here has affected things on a scale that obviously you wouldn't expect. And that's including people who part participate, sorry, and um, keeps in contact isn't it yeah some people have have almost dropped out of the alliance and that would be the ones that were concentrating mainly on just young families but we've had people come forwards who are looking at homeless groups people come forwards who are looking at perhaps elderly people that are isolated and can't get to food so it's changed dramatically in fact, we were just talking the other day, there's a need to um, sit down and reassess, isn't there, about yeah, everything? The completely. Alliance. Thank you, ladies. Um, so Adrian Lovett is saying, well done on the successes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, how do you think enough funding can be achieved to carry on the work, especially in convincing central government about what is most important and effective? Wow. very good question <laughs> that's a hard one isn't it um yeah I've done. <laughs> i think government's quite happy to see voluntary groups like ours bear the brunt frankly um luckily the trussell trust has been amazing in supporting us all but um I, and I, I honestly with the best will in the world don't see how local government is going to be able to do too much for us because there's going to be such restraints on their purse following on from COVID. Yeah. I think it's going to fall heavily on good old volunteers, isn't it? Yeah, there's a few charity organisations where you can apply for um, small pots of money, but they are, it's like pocket money style. And some local wards will offer some because they're raised. You've got some businesses sometimes. We've had money from businesses that have done charity work and want to hand over the money because they know the work we do gets to the right people. Um, and that's how we've been sort of plodding along, hasn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that does sound really tough. Um, there's another question that's come in here, um, and this is more on the research side. So did mental health come up in any of the research that you did? Um, and is it a sort of determinant of um, poverty or is poverty determining mental health? Is there anything that you saw around that? That's from Tessa Roberts. It, it did. It, it certainly came up. I mentioned it, I'll talk about it in a second in this terms of stigma and the shame that people experience from not being able to afford the food they want to buy or having to go to a food bank. Um, we didn't kind of investigate mental health kind of separate to that in terms of depression and anxiety, but actually that's a project that I've just started now looking at the relationship between food and security and mental health in York as well as in other cities. In terms of its relationship, I mean, there's, I think it's certainly, there is certainly the relationship of, of poverty causing poor mental health and actually poverty creating shame, stigma, self-esteem, depression, anxiety is, I think is well evidenced. And, and there is evidence showing that it, it goes the other way. It didn't kind of come up in our research, but that actually um, poor mental health can actually mean that it's more difficult to find employment and then that causes poverty and then it's just a cycle really. Um, hopefully after the research I do now, I'll be able to kind of clarify some of those relationships a bit more there's also the fear attitude if if you are worried about what you're going to feed your children or yourself tomorrow it takes away today 
So that's one of the things that we've found by being able to give people decent food packages. It stops mm-hmm. them worrying about tea time. It stops them worrying about breakfast. And suddenly they can start thinking about next mm-hmm. week. So it allows a little bit of hope and planning. Sorry, we've got Georgia here. <laughs> so fear, I think, has a huge effect around food insecurity and therefore mental health issues. Also, people who already have mental health issues, even the mild anxiety, York here anywhere, mental health services have dramatically decreased due to funding, um, regardless of demand. Um, and COVID as well, obviously, cuts this um, service, even though they're trying their best, um, they would say. So I think that has a massive effect on people's um, mental health um, on a ridiculous level. And we've seen that increase in people that we wouldn't think um, would have this difficulty. And obviously they have food and it's it's not, it's anybody. You don't know who has have mental health issues. Um, you can't spot them down the street. It's, yeah, it's increased loads. Thank you for that insight. Um, Glyn Smith is asking, has the Alliance worked with other strategies or programmes to address some of the wider in issues of food security, such as um, food, food poverty, for example, or um, unemployment, um, to take an, a holistic approach, basically, to health? And if so, how? And he's saying, thank you for a great presentation. I concur. Yeah. Um, we've been in loads of groups, some of which Maddie um, knows of as well. Um, some of them are participatory, so people have to come in and join. And um, they're doing this through videos, through talk conversations, through Zoom meetings. People can do their own um, diary entries, which are helping people to communicate and connect to other wider communities, not just in their area, but they realise. Um, which helps the mental health that other places within the UK national that are also in the same situations. And it has actually helped determine what areas have more support than others as well, which is probably helping them. There's been a few art projects that have been on the go. I mean, we've tried to set a couple up right at the beginning of COVID, um, but obviously then COVID rules and everything comes into play. Um, there's so many things out there. I mean, we're part of quite a few groups some of them are local some of them are national yeah. groups and stuff Re- recently well it's been ongoing since just before covid the food alliance we've moved on and we've gone working a partnership with a group that are looking to set up a poverty fruit truth commission here in in york so that brings together people who have suffered through poverty for whatever reason, um, local employers, a local council to look at, I mean, this is right up Maddy Street, it's bringing everything in together to form an absolute picture of how we can all tackle the issues in and around poverty, whether it be housing, food, employment, holistically, and get a clear roadways forwards. So we've got big, we've got big plans for this. We have got a few, yeah. There's a few other plans in the pipeline as well. And like I say, we're working with the human rights, financial exclusion people. We've got other projects and they also try and do things holistically as well. We've got um, online workshops, which we're actually doing one soon to bring all, bring all this together, which is, um, it, it is an art project based project, but it works in, in the sense of just releasing your thoughts and your opinions and getting these people's real um, experiences and not what the papers say, not what the government thinks or the local councillors thinks, but real people from all backgrounds, whoever they are. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things in the pipeline and things that have been happening. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Kirsteen Shields is asking um, just to remind her of how many people or how many organisations are in the Alliance, how many members, um, and also um, how did you gather the information for the maps and create them? Okay, as for members, it's quite fluid. Um, like I say, we can't get exact numbers because we've taken over as co-chairs and COVID happens and people have come and go. Um, we do work alongside, so York has loads of little mini food market hubs, food banks, and official food banks. And obviously they have members of those and they all understand that we're the Alliance and we come together. So there's a good eight plus groups and each one of those obviously has a couple of people working there. Um, there's a few other people who can come in. So yeah, it's, it's a hard one to answer right now and you're right, we probably should get that information sorted out. But I think when COVID settles, it'd be an easier thing 
to sort out who is still joining us at the Alliance. Um, so what was the other question again? Um, the other yeah. question was about the maps. How did you create those? Because they're a fantastic initiative. What, how did you go about that? Yeah, it's Maddie, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so that was done mainly by our research assistant who just put in a lot of legwork to kind of find out what was going on and then follow those links through words of mouth to find out what else was going on. And we spent a lot of time just making sure we had... So actually, it, on, the, on the maps itself, you kind of, it shows the, the, the name, the location, any kind of any restrictions on access, like a referral system um, and times of opening. But then we collected lots and lots of additional data in addition to that um, about like when it was founded. So we had a good, a good sense of, of um, provision in York. So it's essentially, in some ways, it was just through perseverance. Whenever you create those maps and Sydney, uh, maybe will know very well, things are changing often a lot of the time. Things open and close very quickly. So it's about kind of really kind of getting to the grassroots and really talking to everyone you possibly can about what is going on you can't do it without really getting your hands dirty and then we and we knew when we kind of so reduced the first version of the map in about 2019 that it would it would then change and need to be updated but the fact that we had something I think was nice for people that it was a, it was a kind of fun looking map and we did a, a competition with children where they could they like created plates about kind of their understanding of like food and poverty and so I put some of those plates on pictures on the, on the slides and that one of the winner was, was kind of on the back of the map and stuff so it was all like a nice community initiative and I think people liked having something a bit that was tangible they could hold and they could find what was going on. Yeah it's quite fun going to schools and talk, talking to them as well about it. Um, on the back of that we've tried and thought about do, redoing oh. the food map a few times haven't oh. we? We've decided to wait because yeah. it's so fluid <laughs> at the moment yeah. What we've done is talk to all the unofficial food banks and the food banks and any organisations also in York that are trying to help and um, um, accessing food for people and we've managed oh. to make various of lists and put it out there on social media Ooh. and we've all shared it so we've all come together i tried doing this a few times but like i say it changes so often um that there's no point doing a hard copy of anything so like maddie said it's it's getting dirty and getting in talking to people and getting all this data sorted out okay absolutely thank you very much um what are the different types of initiatives going on? I know there's, there's a lot more, but Lopamundra is asking, um, is it all food aid? Are there other things going on? Food aid is the hook, really. I mean, I'm sure Maddie has sort of talked at this on length and it would be included. And thing. Food, when people are hungry, they will come and talk to you. And once you've got them there with a the force of a nice shiny apple, you come and talk to me. Then when you find out about the underlying issues, be it clothing, how to get to school, the need for the computers, all of that comes out in a nice conversation. So um, we, we kind of use food as a hook. And at one point we had um, a very nice little shop in a trendy, you know, these container Sort of shopping centres. We were in one of those right in the middle of York and um, it was actually my son that ran a little shop, Adriano Zero Away Supermarket and people paid a pound and they got a, as many carry bags as they could fill up with produce mm -hmm. and Sydney and I sort of hovered at the side and that's where we got them and they got like basic benefit advice and pointers and we picked up all sorts of information about what we need to do moving forward. Yeah, even in the queues when they were waiting, social distance queues, they all started talking to each other mm. and sharing experiences and, and it was lovely actually. Yeah, so food has definitely been the hook that we use to get people in and tackle the underlying issues where we can. Oh, oh we can't hear you on quiet again sorry thank you very much for that um now um louise from um bristol south gloucester university is asking whether she can get in touch um would you be okay with me passing her details she's helping to research something similar in bristol yeah okay yeah. fantastic louise we can do that no worries um, okay, and I think if you're ready to carry on, um, then I think Maddie was going to present briefly the main research findings um, from this work. Yeah, hey, Grant, thanks, Kate. Um, I'll just give a really quick overview because in some ways it's not the main focus, but just to pull out the key themes that kind of came out from the work that we did in York. So we did a quantitative survey of households for young children about their ex about food insecurity and food bank use, and then we did some qualitative work with focus groups. And just to really emphasize the key themes that are coming out of that were the strong relationship between household income and food insecurity. 
um, we looked a lot about kind of thought about the fact that York, the context in which we're doing the research, York is a highly unequal city. So how does that affect experiences of food insecurity? Um, and it means that living costs are often much higher. So housing costs are higher, that which puts a, a burden on the household budget. And then it also has kind of psychosocial effects, so effects on mental health about how you experience food if you're living in a context that's really unequal and you can't afford the, other, afford the food that other people can. So in our research, kind of systemic factors of social security and housing and transport, as well as household income, were key factors in food insecurity. And then the negative psychosocial impacts of food insecurity were really profound. Um, so the stigma, the shame, the sense of low self-esteem because you can't afford food that other people can, can the sense that you can't afford healthy food. That, um, in, the, in the video right at the beginning, they were talking about kind of the experience, like it's, it's difficult, you can't afford fruit and veg and the kind of corn pieces or good meat that you want to afford because you haven't got enough money in the effect of that. And then, and then these are just a few quotes that kind of came out of the survey. So on the survey, we had kind of multiple questions that were quantitative questions, but at the end, we had a free text question where we just said, um, tell us about kind of anything else you want to tell us about your experience of food in York or what you think about food in York. So then people could just put in the survey what they thought about that. And kind of what were these picking up is that is these experiences of high living costs. So the, the effects of living in an unequal city, which is about how much higher living costs and how that affects your budget, um, but also about the stigma and shame that people experience and the effects on mental health um, because they can't buy the food that's healthy, they can't afford it when other people can. And the consciousness that actually food represents class, like food is, is highly related to income and it's, it's a mark of often a social status. Actually, if you can't afford that, then that's a really horrible feeling. In terms of food bank use, so in our survey, we asked about food bank use in addition to food poverty or food insecurity. And what we found was that just a minority of people who were food poor, um, who struggled to afford food, had used a food bank. So only 20% of those in our survey who kind of, who said they struggled to afford food had used a food bank. But we did find that actually the relationship between, between food insecurity, food poverty and food bank use was strong. So there were kind of similar characteristics of people who were reporting food poverty and people who were using food banks. They kind of had similar characteristics in terms of low income, um, probably living in maybe council housing. Um, so that demography there was, was similar. Um, and food bank use itself was strongly associated with household income and with particularly with housing tenure, one thing that came across in the data, which in some ways I think it would be good to have a look into more, was that there's a strong link between living in a council house or in social housing and using a food bank. Um, and it would be good to kind of think about why that is a bit more. We also looked at kind of diet and people's kind of practice around food and, and healthy eating. And what came across really strongly in this bit of the research was that actually that people are highly aware of what a healthy diet constitutes, but they just can't afford kind of the components of it. So fruit and veg and fresh meat and fresh fish. Um, people were using lots of strategies to try and ensure they could afford those things, but often they were just out of their reach. We found particularly a kind of uh, a relationship between um, higher processed food consumption and having ever used a food bank. So there may be something about there about particularly in kind of formal food banks, the food that's given, um, but it certainly is something that could be researched more. And then I'll just finish with this. So I'm speeding through so that we can have a chance for Sydney Mary to speak a bit more, but just about the kind of methodological considerations and of doing participatory research, because it, it, the research is, is different because it's kind of a collaboration. Um, so inevitably the population group that we looked at was just, was mainly parents in York. So it's limited because that's what the Alliance was most interested in and that was most important to us. We had to take, we took a pragmatic approach to the survey and the focus group. So we together decided what questions to go in the survey. So some researchers might say they're not kind of the gold standard questions, but to us, they were the gold standard questions because they reflected what we wanted to ask. Um, so particularly in some of the surveys, we kind of co-developed certain measures, like measures and questions around processed food, which might limit kind of comparability with other surveys. Unfortunately, we couldn't analyze the data collectively. So we didn't kind of sit down with the transcripts and together analyze the transcripts. I just did it with a research assistant because of time constraints. Um, but then we talked about the findings collectively and came up with collective policy recommendations. And because we only collected data in one city, it's not really generalizable to the whole population, but it is to kind of other similar cities in the UK and 
the findings I think do have resonance um, outside York. Right, well, I've got any questions here, but potentially, Kate and Kate, let me know what you think. We could go on to Mary and Sydney and then just follow up with questions at the end. Yes, I think that that would be a very, very good idea at this point. Thank you, Maddie. Right, well, over to Sydney and Mary then. Yeah, one of the things um, I think we found following on from what Maddie was saying about who would use food banks and, and, and who wouldn't is we found that a lot of people plain wouldn't qualify for food banks because they're possibly quite high waged. However, they're in also got high mortgages. And then perhaps one partner loses a job or situations change and people have found themselves caught with this high high mortgage is now beyond what they can afford. And rent. Yeah, and rent. Right. So, and they can't move because you can't remortgage because they say you can't afford it. People have tried downsizing, but again, they can't remortgage. And they're really caught this invisible hunger because they're, they're, they're needing to access food from anywhere. And that's where they come to us sort of our informal groups, isn't it? Yeah, we do get a different array of, of people. Um, I've had to use a formal food bank before. I think that's where a lot of these stats and stuff uh, come from because at the time there wasn't a lot of unofficial food banks. Now we have absolutely loads. And where they get the food from as well is usually food that goes in the bin. It's perfectly fine to eat um, and donations and everything else, um, funding. Um, but yeah, like the rent here in, in York is extortionate. And like we say with COVID, one goes on furlough um, or you lose your job, you can't just get a council house and be supported. You're you're struggling more than people on on benefits, aren't you? Yeah. And we've got a lot of people. We even split up um, basically marriages or, or families are splitting up. Um, the, the man still is expected to provide for the family and support himself when his wage won't even get him a one bedroom base a one bedroom little flat or whatever you want to call it um so yeah um yeah what else we should talk about yeah and i think not everybody it's a huge generalization and i'm sure you know sort of maddie agrees as well that everybody in council houses they tend to be on lower wages so if you're on a lower wage, you're just so glad. I mean, I've, I've got a council house. I'm so happy I got it because before I got it, my rent was £850 a month and it was just killing us. We'd be a lot more of that now. Yeah, we didn't have that money. So moving into a council house where the rent was just short of £400 a month was just a huge breathing space. And we've seen that with a few families, haven't we, recently. And um, but if you're in a council house and you're low waged, and you lose your job and then you find yourself in um, difficulties with your rents or whatever that that fear of well how can you go any lower what what is the next step i think for good and bad it does drive people to seek help doesn't it they're, yeah. they're not so embarrassed because they do really they're forced just to swallow the pride maybe and come forwards yeah it's like i said before it's amazing the difference between when all this data was collected um 2018-19 to now um it's been incredible not only because back there's this, the term stereotyping for a reason unfortunately you still have that and we me and mary fought that ages ago with the media I went to conferences i went to meetings and tried to fight this stigma in the in throughout the papers and news everywhere, basically online platforms try to fight it because it didn't help people. It didn't help people want to come forward to ask for help. It didn't help people feel good about themselves, which knocks on to mental health issues. Um, I think now, hopefully, everything that's gone through COVID, the amount of people and different people we have. Um, I've had people begging for help because they don't even know how to ask for help. They're in a situation they never thought they'd have ever, ever be in. They were comfortable. They were having this life that you were expected to have. And they lost it all so quickly within a matter of a few weeks. Applying for benefits in this country can take four weeks plus until you get a payment, in which case you're asked to borrow money, in which case you're having to owe that back. There's no help with that. There's no understanding of what you can and can't do to help yourself during this time. Um, you're, on, you're basically kind of on your own. 
um, and do for the local government to say you have to borrow money to sort yourself out just means when you get your payments you have to spend the next god knows how many years trying to get his money pay his money back which means you're less your income is, the yeah level. you're bought yeah, exactly your low poverty level which they are stating you shouldn't be below so it's like a catch-22 and we've had a lot of people where we've we've had to help for different reasons um some of which we can't really discuss because obviously private confidential um but yeah stereotypical with people you, you can't stereotype people anymore who needs help um you can walk down the street and think oh yeah they're doing fine but they're probably not we've had people in trouble almost um sort of representatives from the council have come along and it's they were like well, looking at well-being and they stand there and they say that um food poverty poverty is a lack of education so it's um, not that people cannot afford or access decent food, it's that they're choosing to eat high sugar, high starch, high fat foods um, without any sort of recognition that perhaps that's all people can access. I mean, I know myself, I've had to hand people over a, a bag of pasta and a tin of soup and say, here you go, that's the pasta bake. Where's the nutritional value in that? And, and, and women are crying because they're so excited that they can um, give the kids a hot meal and send them to bed and they'll sleep tonight because they're full up. So this um, we're seeking out to bring together people to understand that it's not a matter of lack of education on what is good food and what isn't, but more an access to decent food. And that is something I have to say that Maddie was absolutely hammering home, Rosie picked it up. That was something that was just there right through everything that we did with the Food Alliance, but it's just become more acute, doesn't it? Yeah, the food prices are going up quite dramatically at the moment um, because of Brexit here. So all that imported fresh food and everything are gonna cost even more. Um, we're seeing this now, everything's going up, fuel's going up, heating your home's going up, everything is, going up dramatically and that's only going to continue and yet our benefit system or our help our wages are not um there are still shops and workplaces that are still falling through where people are losing their jobs so we're at the beginning of something that is going to drag on for a long time and it seems to plateau a little bit now i think from people but I've, I don't, I think that's a temporary plateau. It is going to just spiral down and get worse, mm. I think. But that's why we went for the food. The um, Poverty Truth Commission was yeah. there to gather it in. So building on the foundation that Maddie and, and Rose left for us and see which direction, because hid, hidden hunger has become a huge problem, hasn't it? It has food insecurity, hidden hunger, and also you've got, um, I don't know, what, what are we calling it? People, people with technology, internet, school kids have needed um but what we have seen here in york is community spirit has been absolutely amazing um we had schools that were helping um pay out their own pocket to help holiday hunger um when everybody was off um because of covid mm. um and even families in isolation i think as well because the food parcels the government were handing over were not adequate um in any form at all basically <laughs> um so the community of york's been amazing and businesses have put their hands in their own pockets to help supply decent food for children because they recognize that this is such an importance they are our future we need to feed them correctly um we get a lot of people coming to our food bank which were, were never set up to do a food bank so what we're supposed to do but there was a need so we did this um we went from one day a week to three yeah days. one day yeah <laughs> in a matter of a few weeks um but yeah if we didn't have the foundation that was set up initially rather through the research that maddie set off then we wouldn't have the platform that we've had to be as flexible and bring other groups in and more individuals it just wouldn't have been there would it i, I can't bear to think what it would have been like without having the alliance as that sort of centre core. Yeah, well, I mean, we'd love to do more um, research stuff, will not we, and get new data of what's been going on. Um, and I've been doing some sort of talks with the media. I've been doing interviews and stuff to try and help spread this. So it seems to be the word is getting out there a bit more than it appears to have done before. Um, Sadly, it's yeah. kind of normalising 
yeah <laughs> there is it's great because it's removed the stigma people can come and talk but how sad is it when you think it's it's normal to admit to being hungry it's it's, it's nerve-wracking isn't it really it is, it's scary it's only gonna get worse that's us i think <laughs> yeah yeah thank you so much for giving us an insight there into what's going on within the community and that does sound heartbreaking to be sort of having to uh, having to deal with these things um is is there any support um louise is asking here um and i guess that goes hand in hand with it but is there any um sort of support for the mental health side of things that you've heard about is there any um attempts to understand that other than just um giving food to people yeah. We've been completely left to it, haven't we? No PPE, nothing, no support, no guidance, even though we're uh, essential workers, slash key workers. We, we haven't had support, but the luckily I have a background in working in mental health. So with a bit of serendipity, I've been able to bring to the fore that, that, that kind of work. But it's um, we've spent a lot of time talking to the police, sending out for welfare checks as well people that ring you know and they contact you late at night mm. one person on the on the, the the internet talking to them the other one on the phone saying can you send a policeman to just check on this person there's there's children in the house and the lady's not sounding very good you know mm -hmm. so there's not an awful lot out there it's something that is being recognized and we're all desperately scratching our heads to see what we can do but unfortunately COVID is getting in the way because this, a Zoom like this, it's a thing, but it's by nowhere near the right thing. And when you've got people in a group all coming together, your safeguarding really goes to hell when everybody's names along the bottom, or perhaps you've got somebody who's incredibly vulnerable in a group by somebody who's perhaps a little predatory. You cannot control that the way that you can when you've got people in a group in front of you. So we're trying out, we're just to stick to, here's the food. Sometimes we've been able to give people a little money, uh, an electricity card, that kind of thing, and, 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 and point them in the direction of, of like mind and, and the, the usual sort of groups that deal with mental mm. health. I think the nearest support we've got to are ones where charities and organisations try to create their own, trying yeah. to get people together to talk. That's what I talked about earlier on. And I think that's the nearest people have got to to support. I mean, there is phone numbers and lines you can talk to um, when you're on desperate measures. But then again, they're probably inundated. Yeah. Absolutely inundated. So getting through to an important line is going to be extremely difficult. So, yeah, and talking to other groups in York who we have a huge connection with, they're also having to take it on themselves. Um, and luckily some of these people like Mary have skills and knowledge and have worked in different sectors before so they have that knowledge to go and help and do the right action but there might be other cities in, and organisations in the UK and other places that don't have that um, but they're banging on doors making sure people are okay and when they take food parcels around they might not be able to ask too many questions but you're kind of assessing these people and keeping an eye on them so there's more to the job than just handing out food. It's a big worry and it's quite a hard thing to really talk about as well, all this, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And that's, um, you know, some really interesting points and really, you know, interesting insight around the, the protection aspect there. Um, Hillary's sort of agreeing and saying that she's um, seen the same sort of thing in, in her work in Hull. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I used to come from that way, so <laughs> I remember it well. Yeah, I have to say I'm a kind of Leeds Batley girl myself. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there is a bit of a link. Um, so are there um, any pantries or community based initiatives um, in York? Oh That's Lopez God. asking that. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy Deacon. Yeah, and Church Action Poverty have put out a pantry thing, haven't they? Yeah. Trying to get people to set up a pantry um we wanted to set up a kitchen thing to be honest but um once again COVID's got in the way of a lot of our plans um i think a lot of them are in the making aren't they yeah uh, the, the actual the pantry official pantry project no at the moment no um 
Gavin from Church Action and Poverty, he was desperately trying to get us to do that. But we have very similar projects being run informally all over. I mean, one that comes to mind immediately is a lady called Tracy Deacon from, it lives in Acom. And she sat that it off with a table in front of a house. Then she got a marquee with some freezers in it. And she is doing amazing work at the minute. And again, it's local people bringing their excess, allowing local people that in need to take. And the supermarkets have really got themselves organised on board with her as well, haven't they? Yeah, especially school so, ones have been amazing. Yeah. And she's she's helping out at school. She's putting out breakfast for kids on the way to school, snacks, healthy snacks on the way home, cheeky bit of chocolate. And it's working very much like the Pantry Project, where she's got a huge band of um, volunteers that have come together as well. And they do cooked food, which goes out. Meals on legs, they call it. <laughs> it's a few. There's, there's the choose young choose. There's quite a few that do hot meals, isn't there? Yeah, choose two. Choose two. That's it. And this just sounds like we um, make it sound like an amazing thing. It is amazing to see what people have done, but it's also it's put out there. Obviously, these these things shouldn't be there. Um, these people work for free. They're constantly fighting for funding. Sure. They're constantly fighting for food, and. The, all the hubs that we call them the hubs always um, unofficial food banks are trying to share food and they're working extremely hard aren't they um for nothing and they've worked through covid for this and the majority of them have their own health conditions and should be in shielding mm -hmm. but still now to pick up pick up the job yeah. um the council haven't even come to us and ask us how we're doing um, do we need help? Do we need assistance? Um, do we need any information about how to work safely? <laughs> Luckily, we know what we're doing. <laughs> they will but... send people to us for food, though. They will send yeah, they'll people. send people. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it'd be great to have some of these shut down. We shouldn't need food banks. I mean, we set up one thinking this won't last long, won't need it. And now we've got three. We had three a week. <laughs> and we could have done every single day, no problem. But the problem is would be we couldn't have enough food to hand out. Um, and what is also a little bit worrying is the official food bank data is um collected less people are using the official food bank because they're not getting their fresh foods um also there is more stigma to it it's there is a bit more shame feeling to it which we've tried to tackle um just because of the way their process is um it's good that they're collecting information but while their data is probably collapsing and um decreasing ours is rocketing and going up but it's not collected so we'd love to have done something over yeah. that more but the trustle trust have recognized that here in yeah. york and um they've been brilliant at giving it all the informal food banks we can go now and say have you got any tins we could be doing with some coffee and they are just brilliant at giving the food to us because they understand that people might not access their official food banks as much so they give it to us and we can get it out there they've been very good to have it's been amazing but again, only because they know about us because of the initial work and research done that Maddie and, and Rosie were, were putting out there. Yeah. There's been a lot of, and I'll kind of say this for our listeners who aren't based in the UK, there's been a lot of discussion in the UK media um, about the... Um, how, how do we say this about kind of food vouchers versus um, food yeah. parcels or handouts? Um, and... Lope is wondering, I'm wondering as well, um, whether there's been any discussion kind of um, in, in your community groups around around that and what are people saying? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question and we can probably talk all day about this, don't we? People want vouchers, <laughs> they want vouchers that they can, that, so they can buy what suits their family, what suits their children. If you have any dietary needs whatsoever and you get one of these handout boxes, what do you do? And I'm not talking about lifestyle choices like vegetarianism or veganism. I'm talking about <laughs> diabetic. I'm talking about food allergies and intolerances. And please, when they count hot dog sausages as a food and protein, just no. Yeah. Trust parents. I think, mm. I think the bread, they've now decided that the bread being handed out is not actually classed as bread because no. it's got something in it that shouldn't be edible. It's in yo it? yoga mattresses. <laughs> this bread yeah. was lasting, lasting a over a year. Oh, what, what, white sliced stuff i'm not going to call it bread and also there's no information on the package as well you're getting people in outrage because they're getting pasta in a little bag what kind of pasta is it what is it what am i feeding my children can they actually have this um 
because some people have wheat, boulder wheat or whatever, intolerances yeah. and stuff. What do you do with half a carrot? Yeah. <laughs> and I even rang my school because my daughter might have had an intolerance, which might have come back. And I said, is there any allowances for this? Is there any um, different um, sort of food boxes I could have? And even the schools weren't even aware. They were just told. They weren't even kept in the loop in the communication at all. Um, which is wor worrying, I suppose. Yeah. And the, but, yeah. the things that the government, some of the MPs and things were saying about, don't give people vouchers or spend it on prostitutes. Sorry, I have never met a sex worker yet that will accept a food voucher. <laughs> I've done some work with them, but food vouchers are not the going currency. There are so many misconceptions, it seems, around this. It's just absolutely ridiculous. I have to say that I was watching um, the media a couple of weeks ago in absolute disbelief um, over, over some of those misconceptions. Um, so... I have quite a few people here who um, from different universities, Coventry, Bristol, for example, who would like to reach out to you, um, Sydney and Mary, and also to Maddie to discuss this in more detail. So if you would be happy with that, then can I pass on their details? Thank you very much. Um, so we will do that. So, so I said we're on Facebook as well. We need to update the website now that loads of people have just heard that. But <laughs> <laughs> our more current stuff is on our Facebook page under the York Food Justice Alliance. So you can contact us by there would be um, probably the quickest way for us. Yeah, absolutely. Because as we've seen, there's so many great lessons to be learned here and things that others can take away from them. So thank you so much um, to Sydney, to Mary, to, is it Charlie? Uh, George. George, George I'm sorry. So he's in learning. <laughs> <laughs> and to George for joining us. Um, and thank you, Maddie, as well, for your fantastic um, input and sharing your research with us. Um, and we'll be in touch. Um, thank you to our attendees as well for all their fantastic questions. Um, we'll be in touch with more background information um, to everybody who signed up to the webinar today. Um, thank you all and hope to catch up with everyone soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.